Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. All the time. All the time. Let's just say that. Almighty Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, to have spared our lives to witness another good day in our life. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have this morning to come before your sanctuary to listen once again to your message. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege which are denied to men. Father Almighty, as we shall be fed with the words, with the bread of life, we beseech you, O oh Lord, to let it have a good effect in our life. Let it find further ground in our heart, O oh Lord. Never let our life be this same. We beg you in the name of Jesus to consecrate the message. I know the tongue that will deliver it. Speak to me. Speak to us through me, O oh Lord. And bless every one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. The scripture this morning is the sermon. It's coming from the first book of John. Chapter 2 from verses 1 to 11. The first book of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but only for those of the world. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him, ought he himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Amen. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Amen. And the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Amen. Verse 11. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Amen. May God bless his only word. Uh, this morning, the message that I have for us is different from the one that I'm compared by my master to, to deliver. As I was meditating on what to say, the Lord told me that my servant, I want my people to understand my type of love. That all along, you are all living in your own type of love. And it is time that we understand what is God's love. And that was bring the theme of this morning to be the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. The love of God in Christ Jesus. The meaning of love that is common and familiar with us is that deep feeling or affection that a person has for another or a thing. It is generally assumed that parents love their children and that when we meet the one we think we can share the rest of our lives with, we quickly say we fall in love with such a person in most cases. But sometimes we also hear of another type of conditional love based on contract 
or an arrangement which terminates once that condition is fulfilled. We also see the type of affections that our children show towards their toys and pets. It is another form of love. And we also see some people falling in love with their earthly possessions, their car, their mansion, their money, their wealth or farm and so on. What then is love of God in Christ Jesus? We are told that Christ Jesus came to the world to teach us unconditional love, to show us unconditional love, and to demonstrate to us unconditional love. So then, what is unconditional love? As I was meditating on the true meaning of this unconditional love, my eyes caught the following young people right up of the type of love that our modern society understands by unconditional love, which is based on human thinking. According to them, or according to popular opinion, real true love is unconditional love. All other kinds of love are not really love. But most parents and children don't love each other. And most people in relationship don't love each other. But most people on the planet never experience unconditional love in their entire lives. Or at least, it sure looks so. To love someone unconditionally, according to them, it means that you love the person exactly as they are, exactly as they were before, and exactly as they will be in the future, because people change all the time. So if you love the person, you will love them even if they become something you disagree with. I don't seem to agree with this one. How many parents can say that about their children? How many people can say that about their loved one? Love is not about you. It's not about your pleasure. It's not about your amusement. It's not about what you get out of it or what other people can give to you. You do not own anyone. It's not about your feeling proud to be with someone who always agrees with you or with everything you say and do and never does anything you disagree with. Unconditional love means that the person can just live their life exactly as they choose and you will always be there for them no matter what. This is modern thinking. Unconditional love is more of a spiritual thing. It's not bound by physical things like blood relations and the desire to procreate. It has nothing whatsoever to do with sex. Most people are in relationship because they are honey or lonely. Even if they genuinely think they love the one, but if the people they love suddenly become important or unable or diagnosed with terminal cancer for whatever reason, would they still want to be with that person? Would they get jealous if the person they love wanted to spend time with other people without any intimacy as well? Relationship based on needs are conditional. Hence, love cannot fit into things like dating, relationships, and marriage. If you do not fully understand the true meaning of love, how then can we give to others what we too don't really understand or even have? The philosophers put love under two categories. Need gift, that is the type of love that is returned in appreciation for something given. Under this need gift, according to Greek philosophers, are four types, namely affection, friendship, eros, and charity. And the second type of love is gift love, exemplified by the type of God's love to humanity. Affection. What is affection? It's the type of love we experience in fellowship. The love that develops within a group through familiarity and networking. The type of love that has no strings attached as no one really feels committed to the welfare or predicament of another. It affords us free will to be committed or to remain neutral. And friendship on the other hand is the deep affection of feeling developed for another person based on sharing common goal or aspirations. Friendship among a group commonly referred to as community of friends. In most cases, some groups have a goal or mission that acts as a binding cord 
for such a friendship, which can be for either good or bad or mischievous reasons. We read about the friendship between David and Jonathan. It was love which created or was created by divine intervention, as it is very uncommon in the history of mankind. And then we now come to Eros, romance. And this is also a kind of deep affection between two people and mostly of opposite gender. And these are also subdivided into two, platonic like love, which is pure, genuine, and natural, while the other called Venus has to be sustained with occasional satisfaction of the flesh, desires, and this type are what we have today, which we regard as fornication. Adam and Eve had the pure Eros type of love until Satan opened their eyes, and in the Bible, we still read the life history of great characters that loved their future brides and were patient enough till their union was blessed. We read in Genesis 29, 18 to 30, And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days. But the love he had to her. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I might go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place, and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took leave his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. I'm sure that uh, Jacob must have got drunk. And Laban gave unto, the, uh, unto his daughter Lee, Sepha is made for a handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Lee. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then art thou begot me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her, fulfill her week, and will give thee also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so, and fulfill her week. And he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter in her, his handmaid, to be her maid. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Lee, and served with him yet seven other years. For 14 years, Jacob was living under the same roof with Rachel, and going every day with her into the wilderness with the sheep of her father Laban. And yet was righteous enough not to touch her or to touch Lee, the senior sister. Can we ever find such a situation today? Or that kind of love today? This reminds me of an elderly friend of mine who married a pretty young woman. And they have a daughter about 17 years old. Now one day, he asked me for an advice. He said, one charming and handsome young man used to come to my beautiful daughter. And I sort of like him. Then what happened, I ask. Each time he comes to my house, he concentrates on my pretty wife. He compliments her hairstyle. Each time she visits her hairdresser salon, he notices her new dresses and even the color of the paint of her toes. All those stuff which I have never had time to notice. I mean, after putting two jobs daily to meet the bills, what is my business with what hair she wears or what color or wigs she wears? I don't even know which of the two is after. And both my wife and daughter are all flattered by him that they hardly notice me when he is around. Husband, notice your wife from today. Yes. I advise him since he is a farmer, to tell the young city man, if you want to marry my daughter, you must have to work for me in the farm. Hallelujah! And secondly, 
I told my friend too, you should go and shave off all the prophet Moses the idea that you are carrying about. Shave all your gray hair and start looking young like me. Hallelujah. <laughs> As a young wife, we notice you. The young man accepted the challenge to walk in the farm. But before the end of the month, he started complaining of blistered palms, backache, and mosquito bites on his smooth chin. <laughs> My friend told me he never waited till the end of the month to collect his wages before he disappeared. <laughs> and this type of love is not genuine. Amen. And not the type of love our love Amen. is teaching us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agape. Yes. Unconditional love. Yeah. The third and the highest type of love is a gap of conditional love. It is above Philo's love and Eros love. It is a love that is totally selfless, where a person gives out love to another person, even if this act does not benefit her or him in any way. Whether the love giving is returned or not, the person continues to love even without any self benefit. It is like you help out a person, even though that person hates you or curses you, or you take insults from your partner without hitting back, all the while forgiving and praying for your partner to amend her ways or his ways. Amen, amen, amen. Or the same unconditional love that a mother has for her child, her child will always be the most beautiful child in the world to her, no matter what. Amen. Or the love we show our parents, taking care of them and helping them in their old age, just like they took care of us when we were young. Amen. It is done with or without benefit in return. It is, however, sad to notice today that not many children do care about their parents in old age. Mm. Some even take them to old people's homes yep. and forget them there. While some friends I know here in America conveniently forget their parents back home in Africa, in these in these countries, but they have money to get expensive cars, to live good life, and to spend lots of money on their women. This always makes me ponder in my mind: where do we parents go wrong, and why does it have to be so? If parents invest all their resources on their children, they assume they are investing against the old age, when the children in turn will be able to take care of them when the flesh is weak. But Western education without God has taken care of them or has taken that touch of human sympathy from their heart or conscience as parents bring up these children to have the fear of God in their heart. Let them write the commands in their heart so that they will not depart from them. The message is no longer for the church alone, but for your advantages as parents to take more active roles in the education and moral upbringing of your children so that in your old age you may enjoy them but not totally to depend on them. Hence, you too must save against your old age. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And no matter how much we care, no matter how much attention we give, some of them will still choose to be rebellious yeah. and glorify in insubordination. Yeah. And in such cases, drastic actions are not necessarily the answer. But prayer as parents as mothers for your sons and daughters for God to touch their hearts. Because I tend to believe that God always listens to the prayers of the mothers than the fathers. I don't know why. <laughs> Do not leave the prayer to your pastors alone. Amen. But you yourself go to God Amen. and open your heart to him to help you. To rescue your child because Satan has planted all his agents all over the world today. And within our community, to go about planting the seeds of rebellion, greed, arrogance, and false hope in their bloated ego. However, 
the highest type of agape love is not human at all, but divine. God's unconditional love for us, his children. Amen. God's love was shown to us the most when God the Father sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to his suffering and death on the cross for our salvation. Amen. There is no greater love than this. Jesus had no obligation to die for us, but he chose to. It is his gift, his ultimate gift. He chose to die for us because he knew what would happen to us, to all mankind, if he left us on our own. Without Jesus, death on the cross, mankind is doomed to eternal damnation, and no soul will be able to enter eternal life in heaven. The sins of mankind, since the first sin of at Eden by Adam and Eve, has become so many and so great that no man can redeem himself by his own means alone. Even each person suffers and dies on the cross. It will not be enough to repay sin's debt to God. Only the begotten Son, Jesus Christ himself, dying on that cross for us, will repay our debt of sin. And what does the Bible teach us? The popular one we find in the book of John 3.16. For God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son that whoever or whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. We also read in Isaiah 53, 4-5 Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did extend him stricken, smiting of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are here. Amen. 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 And also Apostle Paul, in Ephesians 1, verse 7, he said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he had abundant towards us in all wisdom, and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had proposed in himself. And Colossians 1, 12 to 14 said, Giving thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who had delivered us from the power of darkness, and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through blood, even the forgiveness of sin. And 1 Corinthians 13, <clears throat> 4 to 8, provides a perfect description of agape. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. Amen. We assure ourselves that we love God. But no sooner anybody offends us or has misunderstanding with us, we quickly turn to the black record book, which we keep in our heart, to expose and fight back somebody we said we love yesterday. Oh, glory. Tolerance. Mm. An ability to accommodate others' lapses become unacceptable because it is all about us and not how can I lift him or her back on track. We forget that we too are not perfect. Some people, other people are bearing our own inadequacies and misgivings. In essence, Eros love is physical. Philo's love is mental. Agape love is spiritual. Thus, it is made up of three fundamental elements of man. Physical, mental, and spiritual. 
in order to fully understand and appreciate the true meaning of God's love in Christ Jesus, we will need to know the truth of this type of love and why he should lavish such unconditional love on us humans. Our Lord summarized this unconditional love in John 15, 12 to 13. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The Bible is here telling us that Christ laid down his life for us sinners, and what a great sacrifice for us. Do we really deserve his love? Are we entitled to have it? Are we justified to receive this unconditional love? Why should God have to give his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrificial lamb for us? When the psalmist say in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. The love of God is so divine and so mysterious that no one has been able to quantify or comprehend it because it is the foundation of God's super plan for the redemption of human race. Hallelujah! Amen. It is hard for many to comprehend or to understand how God can save them as sinners. As a result, most people are running away from God out of fear. This is one way the devil, the enemy of souls, veils or hides the good news of the gospel from men and women. Sometimes when we are about to receive our blessing, sometimes when we are about to be lifted up to our glory, the devil will put the spirit of anger into us and will say we are backing out. Because the devil knows what we will become if he allows us. But it is up to us to be able to stand our ground. When Apostle Peter told our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, don't let us go to Jerusalem. And what did the Lord say? Get thee behind me, Satan. When you are in that situation and you are about to back out, all you have to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. I have now put my hand on the plow. There is no turning back. For whatever, backward never. Hallelujah. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The apostle Paul was a persecutor of the Christian church made this profound statement to young Timothy. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. The reason why we sinners do not need to be afraid of our Father God and can come to Him with full confidence is because God is love. Today, we will try and discover the true love of God that is the cornerstone of our salvation. Once our eyes are open to this fact, the good news will become fantastic and incredible good news, which we have all received through grace from God.